Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and today we're going to continue our series of The Experts Debunk the Flat Earth. Today's topic is going to be level. Here we have my triple water level. Notice that all three columns of water are exactly at the same level. We'll discuss why that is in a moment. Plus, it also gave me a chance to show off my new Celestron telescope. So, let's cue up the music and get back with Wolfie, Charlie, and Blue Marble Science. All right. Well, let's move on to the next one here. Water finds its level. What's that mean? Well, the flat Earth is like to think that level equals flat, but that's not necessarily the case because when we when we fly aircraft, we fly at flight levels, and that is not a flat line. It's a curve line that curves around the Earth, and uh, basically, the the level simply means it's the same altitude above the ground as we fly. So if you fly a quarter of the way around the Earth, you're still at the same altitude above the ground, but that flight level is not um, flat, and, and water's the same. Water has a elevation or, or a sea level that's basically just uh, like you could measure it from the centre of the Earth, but water finding its level does not mean that it's flat. It just finds the most efficient form based upon all the forces that is acting upon it. Well, one of the engineers used the term equal potential. Mm -hmm. So equal potential energy, you familiar with that term? Yeah, that makes sense. Now this yeah. water level is a good example of equal potential. Potential energy has to do with the height above the center of the earth times the force of gravity. Each of these columns is exactly the same height above the center of the earth. So if one of the columns, say the one in the middle, was higher than the other two, it would have higher potential energy than the back two limbs. And what would happen is, is that the column of water would come down until its potential energy equaled the potential energy in each of those back two limbs. So the equal potential energy of the surface of the water. Now, as you say, there are other factors that can change water level. Mm -hmm. Gravitational attraction from the moon and the sun gives us tides, for example. Exactly. And if you have the misfortune to be in the eye of a hurricane in very low pressure, the water will be a little bit higher there too, won't it? Sure. Does water actually bend? Didn't you do an interesting video the other day about bendy water? Yeah, it just had a, uh, a fish tank in a, a rotating uh, dais and the water was, uh, sorry, it was concave. The water was concave, um, higher at the outer edges of the tank and lower towards the center. And that was just due to the, uh, the additional centrifugal force of the rotation. Now, as that water tank was rotating, did the fish feel the rotation? Well, that was actually part of my video. It did not appear that they did. They were swimming around just fine. The only thing that I did notice was the orientation of the fish was matching the orientation of the surface of the, of the water. It's almost as if the fish were detecting the forces involved that were bending the water. Yeah, you could say that, yeah. So later in the video, they spin the tank with fish. And as you can see, the fish have no trouble at all swimming around normally while the tank is rotating. What is even more interesting is that the orientation of the fish changes depending upon where they are in the tank. At the center, where we simply have the force of gravity, the fish have a normal orientation. At the ends, where we have a combination of gravity and centrifugal force, they are responding to the resultant of that force. So they're basically swimming as if that direction is up and down. On the left-hand side, they're acting as if that direction is up and down. Well, this is a slide that's not really discussed by any of the experts, so I'd like to take a minute and just address it. What is Einstein's equivalence principle? If you were to imagine sitting in a rocket and being accelerated on launch, you would be pushed back into your seat. You would feel that force of acceleration. Now, the force of acceleration due to an actual movement of the rocket 
is indistinguishable experimentally from the acceleration due to gravity. So in other words, if gravity is accelerating us at 9.8 meters per second squared, and the rocket is accelerating us at 9.8 meters per second squared, we would perceive no difference between the two. We can't tell what the acceleration is coming from. We only feel the acceleration. Now, in the example of these fish, we have two accelerations. The first is the acceleration of gravity going straight down the fish tank. Then we have the acceleration due to centrifugal force, which goes out to the sides of the fish tank. The fish are simply reading the direction of that acceleration, which is why the fish on the side are at an angle, whereas the fish in the center are horizontal to the floor of the fish tank. That's also why the equal potential surface of the water in the fish tank curves like that because it's responding to the two different forces. It's got a force of gravity going down. It's got a force from centrifugal acceleration going outward. The combination results in that curve. It's a very interesting thought experiment if you want to try and think it through. Fish, fish will do that. They have, air, they have air bladders and other things in them that allow them to sense the direction of, of, the, of the force vector. Another thing that uh, uses that are the casting of the mirrors at the University of Arizona Mirror Lab, where they actually spin the whole mold that the glass is in in order to achieve an initially initial parabolic shape on the front surface. It vastly could, it reduces the amount of glass that's necessary in the mold the annealing time enormously. So once again, just as spinning the fish tank at one revolution a second causes a parable to be set up in the surface of the water in the fish tank. The same thing can be done with molten glass when you're casting a very large reflective mirror for a telescope, such as the giant Magellan telescope, which is what those mirrors were for. And by spinning them, you cause the liquid glass to come up on the edges and concave down in the middle. And by controlling the rate of the spin, you can control that dip. So you can precast the mirror in roughly the shape you're looking for, and that cuts down on the amount of grinding that you have to do, which is the purpose of having that huge rotating furnace. Uh, water finds its level. You bet it does. Yep. And what exactly is that? What is level? What is level? Level is perpendicular to the normal force wherever you happen to be. In other words, perpendicular to the radius of the Earth because the normal force is the direction of gravity towards the center, right? It is correct. So, on a sphere, the radius lines will be at different degrees and level will mm -hmm. be perpendicular to all of them and move around in a curve, yeah. will it not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, the other thing is when I was talking with Charlie a little bit earlier, he used an interesting term, which I'm sure you're familiar with as well, and that's equal potential. Yeah. So the surface of the water is equal potential, which means it's the same distance to the center of the Earth. It has the same potential energy. No water is higher than yeah. other water. <clears throat> unless, yeah, it has the same, same gravitational potential. Yeah. Now, unless there's another force acting on it, such as centrifugal force or the gravitational force of the moon and sun causing tides. Yep. All right. Now, have you ever seen bendy water? I've ever seen bendy water. I went to Niagara Falls one time. It looked pretty bendy. But yeah, it kind of bent over about 90 degrees on that, didn't it? You're trying to find yeah, its it potential, lowest potential energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen bendy water? No. Well, guys, I first became aware of the curve of the earth personally when I was about nine or ten years old. Uh, I was living in Florida at the time, and I remember one of my mom's friends brought a pair of binoculars to the beach, and I was looking at a ship out on the horizon. And I was trying to see the whole ship, but I noticed that there was this big bulge of water that seemed to rise up between me and the ship and I couldn't see the bottom of it. That really kind of struck me as a pretty graphic example that we were living on a curved earth. The other time was in December of 1972, during the launch of Apollo 17. 
We lived about 150 miles south of Cape Canaveral, and we were listening to the launch on the radio. Now, we knew exactly the time that that Saturn V cleared the tower at Cape Kennedy, and we began to look for it in the north sky. And it was a good 20 or 30 seconds before we could actually see the rocket. We thought that we had missed it, and then all of a sudden, there was an enormous flame coming up the horizon. It was really dramatic and very obvious as to what it was. But it took a good 30 seconds for that flame to appear to us. That's because in order to clear the horizon, that Saturn V had to reach an altitude of over 17,000 feet, and that's how long it took it to get up there. In our next episode, we're going to talk about a great subject. Do we see too far? Now, by the way, this is going to be a two-parter coming up because there's a lot of things that we can talk about, everything from Al Biruni to the Black Swan. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Hey, make sure you hit that like and subscribe and ring the bell icon down there so you can catch the next episode of this series. I'll see you again soon and take care.